Today, I'm going to be answering the question, what makes human beings unique? Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. This was a question posed to me by a viewer in response to my video on what should Christians make of AI. And um, this is going to be, if you've ever seen that meme where it's like a bell curve, where you've got a microcephalic person and then the person with the beautiful beard and the robes, and then the, the midwit is sort of like right, you know, in the middle. And these two are saying the same thing and this guy is saying the opposite. It's going, this is, they're kind of these three things and, and each one has their, you know, sort of, it's a, per, we're going to consider each perspective in turn, basically. Um, and that's going to be the format of this video, essentially, because that's really the way we need to address this. And um, it, it's going to be one of those things that's along the lines of the, uh, there's like some Chinese, it's not a proverb, but a story about, uh, you know, before a person learns anything, a mountain is just a mountain. As a person begins to learn, a mountain is no longer a mountain. And when they have completed their studies, a mountain is a mountain again. It's kind of going to be one of those things. Um, the so, so, I mean, on the basic level, there's not much to say. It's basically like, well, there's nothing like us. I mean, just look around, use your eyes, use your ears, do trivial amounts of thinking, and obviously there's nothing like us. And if you're arguing with this on this level of things, you're just a moron who's wasting people's time. There's kind of nothing else to say about that. That part, it's true, but there's nothing else to talk about, so it's not very interesting. <sighs> Trying to say what the content of that is is one of those things where you then have to like get up the hill and back down again, and that getting up the hill is highly complicated by some history that we just need to go over briefly in order for this to make sense. And that is the history of the Enlightenment, in which there is the attempt to replace discur uh, reasoning with discursive reasoning. So reasoning is, the, is essentially where the mind conforms itself to reality. It takes on a, essentially an image of the pattern or, or, or the, the texture of reality. I don't mean pattern as an abstraction. Um, and so there, there is some sense in which the mind itself forms an image, imago, or, you know, ikon in the, in the Greek. Um, but it's like a thing that is like the other thing. It partakes of its nature in some way, though not in its totality, um, of the thing. That's reason in its full sense. And discursive reason is when you abstract this into words. And there is an attempt in during the Enlightenment, essentially, to replace reason in the full sense with purely discursive reasoning. Um, for historical reasons relating to a desire for radical certainty, roughly speaking. And there was this idea that if you could, if you could do this, if you could do the reasoning this way, then you would have the radical certainty that you want. It's a completely failed project. It's outside the scope of this video to talk about why. I've talked about it in sort of piecemeal here and there in a variety of other videos and look up the history. You know, postmodernism essentially destroys modern philosophy, which is the philosophy of enlightenment. And so like, you can just sort of look up into why it does. Like postmodernism is not true, but it's destruction of modern philosophy is. And um, basically, you know, part of why this doesn't work is because reason in its full sense works. Discursive reasoning is essentially just a collection of signposts. It's symbols that point at things. And the idea is that as you follow it along, you're directing the attention of your mind to various parts of reality, wherein your mind will then conform itself to the reality itself, where these signs are just drawing your attention to it. It can't work in the full sense. The idea, and it goes along with this desire for radical certainty that you see in the Enlightenment, was the idea that we should have, that everything should be done uh, by measurable things. And uh, by measurable, kind of what they really mean is things where when people look at them, they will have the same or sufficiently similar experiences that they will agree with each other about what the experience of looking at the thing was. So, uh, for example, when you measure something with a measuring tape, you, you line it up and, every, and most everybody will look at it and say like, yep, that's two feet, four inches. And, um, again, outside of the scope of this video, even that doesn't really work very well. There's some things that it works reasonably well about. There's a reason we tend to actually intermediate all of the stuff with machines that, um, in, in fact, uh, remove the, the human experience from it so that we're over, you know, simplifying it down. Um, this is not a video about the, the nature of knowledge, so I'm not going to go into it any more than that. But that idea of like measurable things was an attempt to achieve that sort of radical certainty. And so the response to this of like the fact that we're like obviously unique in the world um, met with this, well, let's quantify that. How are we actually unique? What is it that actually distinguishes us from all the other things by which they mean what measurable thing distinguishes us? And right there you run into a problem um, because when you're reducing what distinguishes us from other things down to a measurable thing, um, 
the, it's actually our nature being different that is the big thing that distinguishes us from everything else. And you're not allowing that portion. You're only allowing sort of external things. And so, you know, if you ask somebody to take it in the field of computers, um, I'm, I'm a professional programmer, so I often go there. If you ask somebody like, what distinguishes a, um, you know, a high-end GPU with 4,000 computational units from a low-end one with a mere 1,000 computational units, and you're only allowed to do this in terms of the pictures that are put onto the screen. Well, it actually gets really, really hard, and it's, you're really prone to trying to define the differences between these two things in ways that do not... Um, that don't really capture the actual difference. Like you might go in terms of like frame rates, but then, you know, eventually you will find as, as GPUs progress, a, a GPU that has the number of computational units, but they're a heck of a lot faster, other technical details I won't get into. And now it's got that frame rate. Aha, you don't actually know the difference. There was no difference between these things. You just thought this, but there is no difference. And that's that kind of Midwit Hill thing. It's the the problem with that of trying to do this by external characteristics is that you are you are trying to radically simplify things down to just one small little element. Um, you know, and, and on this particular subject, that was you know you'd see things like oh we're a tool using species, and then you find um, you know you'd find chimpanzees that that. Um, you know, we'll pick up sticks and use them like, oh, we're a tool making species. And you'll find a chimpanzee that like pulls part of the twig off and like technically it made a tool. Um, and you can find other things. You can find even surprisingly simple. You can find insects that make tools. In fact, um, I can't remember which one's off the top of my head, but I know I've seen it. Anyway, the point being, this is a failed project in general, because the thing that makes you different is having a different nature. And it is trying to quantify this different nature by means of external behaviors. But like the external behaviors are so dependent upon the environment, they can never capture the nature of the thing. And that's kind of why this is a failed project. So if you're trying to define like human beings can, can do arithmetic, well, you can make machines that can do arithmetic. And, um, you know, I, like one that I just like using when I get frustrated with people is like, we write by, uh, we write textbooks about them and they don't write textbooks about us. Um, so like that is, you know, and you know, throw it on there on your own if you want to. Anyway, so, you know, for all the animals that works just fine. It doesn't at all get at the heart of what, what's you're actually trying to get to. You're not trying to... It, it doesn't get at the fact that we have a different nature than all of the other animals. I, I mean, we share a bunch of our nature with the other animals as well. Um, but, you know, it, we have a noticeably distinct nature from the other animals. And, you know, like, that works perfectly well. You, you will not anywhere find an animal who has written an entire textbook about human beings. There aren't any. The... Does that actually satisfy in any way at all? No, not even slightly. It's not the, in the slightest of satisfying. Oh, the distinction between us and other animals is we write textbooks about them and they don't write textbooks about us. It's a pointer at the fact that we have a rational nature. Um, you know, but in particular, well, really the big difference is we have a human nature because you could, in theory, have another type of animal with a rational nature that, you know, you could have one that was insectoid with eight legs and antennae and so on. Like, there's no reason that could not have a rational soul. It would be possible for them and for us to both have, ra in, in theory, to for them and us to both have rational souls, at which point, like, the thing that distinguishes us from them is the fact that we're human and not this insectoid creature. And you wouldn't be able to point to some, like, measurable thing and, you know, you'd always find some more and it's like, well, if you chop off 18 of their legs, they're only left with two legs or, you know, four, if you want to count our arms as modified legs or whatever. And all of that type of attempting to get at this through some sort of external thing, like we can do this and they can't sort of thing, isn't really answering the question. It's, it's basically entirely beside the question. And it's more or less going down that path of the the attempt to get universal consensus and the truth of the matter is there are idiots in the world who will deny things that are obviously true and the attempt to by the way uh, just historically and this may shed some light on it because another alternative thing which is from the same thing about measuring the same the motivation as measuring you saw within political philosophy within the enlightenment the attempt to come up with political systems in which um 
you know, even devils will follow the rules, something along the or even devils will obey the laws, you know, a system that is designed so well that even malevolent actors who hate goodness for its own sake will out of, you know, the, the interest of just following whatever the, it is they want to do still abide by all of the laws. That too is a failed project. You can't come up with such a system. They tried, they tried very hard. And that, that was the goal to have a system where everyone will agree. And you can't, people don't all agree. Um, People don't all agree about anything whatsoever, even about measurement type stuff. Um, it, it just doesn't work. It's a failed project. You will not get universal agreement. And the, the, just as a historical note, the psychological reason for this desire for, for universal agreement was essentially that desire for radical certainty because being social animals, if everyone agrees, we feel really, really, really certain about something. And so if we can just get everyone to agree, then we'll have this kind of you know, complete certainty that, that was desired. You can't. That certainty is not available, it can't be found, you can't find it by measurement or by anything else, it doesn't actually work. You have to have the courage to embrace the truth even though there are people around you who deny it. That's the human condition in this fallen world. And so, this is how we start getting off of this hill and, and back to the other side of how are we distinct. Essentially, like it is interesting to consider the distinction between looking at the external things that we do, like, like externally you know, measurable things that we do and our internal nature. And it is an interesting intellectual exercise to try to see like, is there some external thing that, you know, measurable external thing that, um, you know, th by which you can, um, you know, distinguish this internal, you know, nature. And, you know, it's kind of a fun game, but it's a useless thing to do. And so when we take this to AI, and here we're coming, as I said, to the end of this. Um, now, again, like the, the problem, like the distinction between AI and us is that AI is, you know, a machine. It is a machine that, um, you know, operates by way of, you know, massive matrix multiplications that encode um, various patterns, roughly speaking. And so there are various things, and we don't know by any means the full scope of what can be done through this sort of, you know, pattern work. And bear in mind, you could literally do 100% of all of this on pencil and quite a lot of paper. I mean, a lot of pencils and even more paper. You could work out all of the calculations by hand, come up with the answers, and, you know, out comes the result. Um, and I, I think noting that sometimes helps to demystify it. The fact that it's like a computer where you apply electricity makes it like, wow, it's a machine. It's, it's like us, but like, it's literally, uh, this is not actually true. Uh, when I said literally, literally is not actually true. What it is metaphorically doing is all of the calculations. What's actually happening is you, you, there's a level of interpretation on a strict philosophical sense required to get this. So strike the literally thing. What it is metaphorically doing is just identical with writing out calculations on pencil and paper. And so, um, you know, what is it that this sort of, like what sort of patterns can be encoded in large collections of matrices that if you multiply correctly, um, you know, outcome other patterns that are, you know, to us desirable. And we don't know what the full scope of that is. It looks like there are a lot of them. It looks like the the scope for doing, you know, the, the scope for being able to achieve things through this kind of method is very, very large. And so at present, trying to do this enlightenment era, like let's find a particular measurable behavior, which can then distinguish the actual internal reality that we do not have direct access to, except I mean, we're human beings and we actually have direct access to ourselves. Um, but anyway, the, um, nonetheless, we're going to pretend we don't have direct access to ourselves. And so we're going to look for some externally measurable thing. And when it comes to AI, that's basically extremely a fool's errand because we have no idea like what all will eat you know, will this approach be able to accomplish in terms of effect, and especially in terms of measurable effects? Um, so that's not an approach to try to use. It, it's, you know, you can come up with them right now, but, AI, you know, the AI stuff may, you know, people may figure out ways of making it actually have that externally measurable effect. Uh, you can call it behavior if you want. Um, and at which point you'll be like, uh, okay, It'll be completely unsatisfying. You're like, well, yeah, but it doesn't do it in the same way as us. So, like, turns out that just is not a very useful distinction. Uh, let's try to find some other one. And if for some reason somebody's paying this you for this, like, maybe this is a fun way to earn a living. Not the one I want, but maybe it 
it would be, but if nobody's paying you to do this, there's no reason to go about trying to do this approach. It's time to sort of get off that hill into considering like, yeah, we have a human nature. We have a rational soul. We have an animal soul. We have a body. We are all of these things. We're not a ghost in a machine, by the way. Um, you have to avoid the, the Gnostic uh, tendency. You sometimes see it as a Cartesian tendency of like a ghost in a machine where the real us is the soul and the body is just some sort of like weird shell thing. It, you know, our bodies are part of us. It, it's a complex part of us because our bodies actually change out. Um, I mean, our souls change over time too. So the, um, like, what are we, you know, across time is actually a remarkably interesting and difficult problem. Um, but it's not really the subject of this video. I'm just noting that that problem exists with the body or without the body. And um, that it is important to remember that, like, we and our bodies are not distinct uh, from each other. Like, our body is legitimately and truly actually part of us. Um, the, you know, our soul is the soul of our body. Not, this, not, not like some sort of free-floating soul that just can inhabit some kind of body. It is not the right sort of soul to inhabit one of those 18, hypothetical 18-legged insectoid rational creatures. They would have a different kind of soul appropriate to the kind of body that they have. So um, that really is the actual answer. And one of the skills in this life is learning to become satisfied with the actual answer to questions. There are a lot of times as you go through life that there's a particular kind of answer you're hoping for to some problem, but it's not available. It's not, there isn't really a kind of answer like that. And you have to learn to become satisfied with the real answer. Um, the, you know, like, like I'm just an example. I mentioned the one, you know, how can we devise a form of government where even you know, explicitly evil people will still follow all the rules. And the answer is you can't. It's not doable. You don't want that answer, but you have to learn to become content with that answer. It just isn't possible. So what is the way by, like, if you know, okay, so what, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting myself. What is the, what is the external measurable sign by which you can distinguish a human being from a non-human being? Well, I mean, if you know everything throughout the entirety of time to the end of time, this will be an answerable question because you can just look at what are the behaviors that human beings do that other things don't, that nothing else ever did over the entire span of time. And then you're just like picking the entire set, subsets of that, whatever you want. Short of that, you're on the fool's errand of trying to predict what are all the possible states amongst the things that you don't even know about yet. And there's no, there's no possible way of accomplishing that. It's not a worthwhile pursuit anyway, um, because the only possible goal for it of trying to get universal agreement, you will never get anyhow. Um, you know, I mean, just look at the existence of flat earthers, right? There, there, there are plenty of flat earthers. Um, and, you know, like that's about very measurable things that hold, you know, just use measurable stuff and, and everyone will agree. It doesn't actually work. Um, you know, they're, they're, uh, like, like, there are lots of things. There's disagreement about whether astronauts have ever landed on the moon. I mean, th there are tons of things for which you can use as measurable of whatever as you want, and it turns out that doesn't work because there's always interpretation necessary and people interpret differently. Um, there's no such thing as an interpretation as interpretation free data. It doesn't exist. Um, so basically, unfortunately, the answer to this is... Um, you can pick particular things they will work for whatever length of time. We don't know all of the behaviors that we will see. So picking an externally measurable behavior is more, you know, is, is fraught with error. It's not a worthwhile goal to have. The way to distinguish human beings from non-human beings is by the fact that we're human beings in our totality. And it is, properly speaking, the totality of a thing that distinguishes it. So, um, yeah, so, like, what makes us... You know, so, so within Christianity, what makes human beings special? Well, amongst other things, um, you know, God chose to have, have, you know, God's son became incarnate as a human being, died for our sins and rose from the dead. So, you know, like now 
is it possible that in on some other planet that we'll never have contact with on the other side, you know, on the you know where we're neither us or them or in the observable universe from each other, you know, because cosmic inflation means that light won't even reach, um, where you have these sixteen-legged insectoid things that got also incarnated as a sixteen-legged insectoid creature, died for their sins and rose from the dead there too. Yeah, that is possible, but we would still be unique in that God became a human being. And they would be unique in that God became one of those 16-legged, or 18-legged, I forgot how many legs I gave him, uh, insectoid rational creatures. So that would still be the distinction between us, is the fact that we're human and they're, you know, or whatever the heck they, you know, would call themselves. So that really truly is the answer. Like, what makes one thing itself and not something else is the fact that it is itself. And you can sometimes describe them measurably or whatever, you know, in terms of external characteristics, but the truth is... I mean, the real most important answer is the thing that makes them unique is their unique existence and essence, you know, combined, not some externally measurable thing. And, um, yeah, like, unfortunately, that really truly is the answer. You just have to give up looking for that externally measurable thing because it doesn't work. It does. It will not serve the purpose that you are trying. It will not accomplish what you're trying to accomplish, even if you could find it. Um, and so, like, that's, uh, yeah, I, I, I feel bad, because, like, I, I understand the motivation for the question, but unfortunately, I'm in the position of having to give the sad answer if you're asking the wrong question. Um, you know, like, even if you can accomplish it, you would find it completely unsatisfactory. So, you know, I mean, you know, suppose, you know, God or, you know, a time traveler, you know, an angel outside of time or whatever, you know, knowing the totality of time and all possible behaviors told you behaviors that human beings do that nothing else throughout the entirety of history ever did. And you could distinguish us that way. And then like, you know, you look through and, um, you know, and, and the answer turns out to be something along the lines of uh, reciting poetry while eating licorice. Would that be satisfying in the slightest? Like, it's entirely possible that, you know, you could have, you know, all manner of, of things capable of doing all sorts of behaviors, but, like, none of them would eat licorice and recite poetry at the same time. Um, who'd care? I mean, like, it could be completely true. You just wouldn't care, and that's a way of knowing that this is not the question you actually want to ask. Um, so... Yeah, like, you know, we're not at the, the pinnacle of... You know, we're only at the pinnacle of the hierarchy that we're the pinnacle of... Um, you know, we've been given, you know, given dominion over part of creation, but, you know, angels are higher up than us. And, you know, so it, it's not like there, there's like some way of showing that we're like at the top of, of absolutely everything because we're not. So, you know, and, and I mean, even within that, there's the, the interesting hierarchy, you know, the angels are, are much greater than we are, but God never became an angel. God became a human being. And, you know, the angels weren't made in the image and likeness of God, not in the same sense that we were. So, you know, I mean, they, you know, so they're above us, but like, we still have some unique gifts that they don't get. And so like, even that, that attempt to, you know, to rank things doesn't even itself really work. Not, not really. Like the, the truth at the end of the day is that each thing receives the gifts from God that it get, it received. And what makes it itself is the gifts that it got. And even to rank these is like at best kind of, in, you know, it's, it's um, a little bit analogous to like stamp collecting. It's like mildly interesting. It's curious to see, but it's not, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, to, to a great degree, um, like you can see this because right, the purpose of being higher is, you know, being higher, you, you, you know, then have the opportunity to give to that which is lower than you. You can condescend, come down to be with. And you can see this, like, if you know things, you can teach it to the ignorant. If you're strong, you can lift things up for the weak, right? So, um, you know, if, you, if you're intelligent, you can explain things to somebody who is less intelligent. So, like, the, the gift of being higher is the ability to give to that which is lower. But it's often the case that even that which is lower can also give to that which is higher. Like, there's a... Um, th there is... There isn't like a, a, a strictly directed tree. There, there's cyclicality to it, where you might be greater in one way but not in another. You know, we each get gifts, and that's not to say that that like everybody's exactly equal or anything. It's that it's such a complicated, um, you know, multi-dimensional directed graph. You know, you want that sort of abstraction that like trying to rank things doesn't 
really accomplish anything useful. All you can ever do is look for to whom has it been given to you to give something. And, uh, you know, a, a great example of this, by the way, is uh, parents with their children. At first, you give them everything. But over time, eventually, they start giving you things. And, and you know, like the classic model, eventually, like in your old age, when you, you can barely move, now they're physically taking care of you in the way that you did back when they could barely move. And so you even get cyclicalities like that. So, yeah, trying to come up with any kind of, of, of ranked hierarchy is just not useful. So I'm sorry I don't have a more satisfying answer to give, but um, there we go. Until next time, may you hit everything you aim at. If you like this video, then clicking the like button, according to YouTube, will make them more likely to recommend it to others. If you know anyone who might get something out of this video, then it would be kind to share it with them or just share it on social media in general. And if you'd like to see future videos of mine, you can subscribe and uh, if you're not in the habit of checking your subscriptions page regularly, then I suggest clicking the notification bell and setting that to always, because otherwise uh, subscribing to a channel basically just sort of like gives YouTube a hint that maybe it should consider recommending these videos to you, possibly at some point, if they think so. It's a funny world we live in. God bless.